besides the counter. Okay. Yeah, but wait just um so wait till you see your five thing. Yeah, sorry. Um so wait till you see your five thing. Yeah, sorry. There we go. Okay. Testing one, two, three. It sounds like we're working. Good evening. Welcome to the public meeting for the Tasman Drive Bicycle Pedestrian Improvements Project. This is a hybrid meeting. So we have folks in the room and we have folks online. And I think people are coming in. We have some some viewers. I think what we want to do is just give a, li a little time for people to trickle in. So give us maybe two or three more minutes and we'll get started. Okay, I think we're going to get started. Thank you for coming out tonight. I'm glad to see some faces in the room, and we definitely have some viewers in the audience online. My name is Brandy Childress. I am with Kim Lee Horn with my teammates Adam Dinkberg here and Monica Tanner. She's going to be facilitating the discussion online, and I'll let you know what that um, looks like here in a minute. But what we wanted to do is first welcome you, let you know that we've got 
15 minutes of presentation that we'll go through and then we'll do a Q&A. If you can hold your questions until then, if there's something burning that you are not understanding you know, during the presentation, please write it down. We've got comment cards that you can put your question or comment down and then we'll get to you in the audience. And we'll also be taking questions from the viewers online through the chat. Um, we do have, if you wanna go ahead and show this nifty slide that we have, um, in order to participate, here's the, the Zoom that you can click on the Q&A button uh, those, for those of you online and you can put your questions and comments in the box. And like I said, we'll, we'll get to you and we'll ask, ask those out loud here in the room to be answered. And then for those who need this presentation in a different language, we have this QR code where you can, that you can scan and you will have an app that opens up on your phone and you will choose the language that you want to listen to it in and you can get the presentation that way. So I think that's pretty neat. So without further ado, I think we should get started. We're gonna have our project manager, Thin Lee, from the city of Sunnyvale, give a quick update on what this project is and why they're doing it. Okay, thanks, Brandy. Um, so the stu the our study segment is Tasman Drive between Lauren Expressway and Fair Oak Avenue. Why are we studying this segment um, at as we as we shown on the picture, so Tasman uh, Drive corridor lack of bike lane and sidewalk, making it difficult for pedestrian and bicycle to travel. At um, if we looking at the map, that if you see the red line, red line is where it lack of sidewalk, <clears throat> and then there uh, there is um and then there is the gap between um you know for bicycle um for bike for bicyclists to travel on this uh, corridor. And then what is the goal of the study? So but the project aims to make walking and biking safer and more comfortable for on Tasman Drive between uh, Fair Oak and Lowen Expressway. So next I have Adam will talk about the project overview, timeline, traffic analysis, and our proposed improvement along Tasman. Thank you, Tim. Uh, my name is Adam Dankberg uh, with Kimley Horn. I'm the project manager for the consultant team hired by the city to work on this project. Um, so just providing a little more context um, to this study, we're looking at Tasman between Fair Oaks and Lawrence. Um, as, as Tim mentioned, uh, some of the challenges out there today are the lack of sidewalks and the lack of bicycle lanes. Um, there was a pedestrian fatality a couple of years ago in this segment. Um, there's a history of pedestrians um, and cyclists getting hit at Lawrence Expressway, a, a big intersection there. Um, so that's really prompted the need for uh, improved safety for pedestrians and cyclists in this corridor. Um, as part of this project, uh, we will be trying to uh, provide pre continuous walking facilities along both sides of Tasman Drive, as well as uh, improved crossings at the intersections and to improve uh, facilities for cyclists uh, who wish to uh, ride their bikes down this corridor. In terms of the project timeline, we started in late uh, 2023. Um, we, uh, one of our first tasks was to perform a safety analysis on the corridor and perform traffic analysis. Um, we've also spent a lot of time out in the corridor observing conditions and collecting information about the current uh, configuration and, and how much room there is. Um, then we developed some initial design alternatives and worked with city staff on those. Um, and that's what we're coming to share with you here tonight. Uh, we have a couple uh, design alternatives that we'd like to get your feedback on. Um, this is one of the uh, many activities that we're doing for this round of community outreach. We have an online survey we'll be talking about. Um, and then we have some upcoming meetings with the mobile home parks along the corridor. Um, based on all your feedback and input, we'll then go back, refine our alternatives and come back uh, to you one more time. Um, and collects more information that will then allow us to go to the city council uh, towards the end of 2024 and get their input on uh, how and if this project should move forward and then have actually uh, something implemented. So the goal is to wrap up the final report and get council input and direction by the end of 2024. Um, and this is just a study, so nobody's going to start um, you know, you won't see construction crews out there uh, right away. It'll take some time to to get the funding and and uh, get designs advanced. So there's still plenty of work to do. Um, but the idea is uh, with this study to be able to figure out uh, what improvements the community wants to see in this corridor and then how to move uh, something forward. So as I mentioned, one of the first things that we did on this project is to take a look at traffic conditions. Um, I think most of you are aware that uh, during the pandemic, 
Um, the city closed one of the eastbound travel lanes using some cones and bollards um, and uh, basically reserved that space for pedestrians to use between Fair Oaks and Vienna. Um, we did some traffic analysis recently, and the city has been continuously monitoring traffic. And, and as you can see in the chart here on the right side, um, traffic volumes still remain much lower um, than they were uh, before the pandemic. So they're down uh, about 25% in the eastbound direction, about 34% in the westbound direction. Um, so it's clear that just traffic has not returned, um, even as conditions have returned to a, a new normal uh, since the pandemic. Um, and so we did traffic analysis to see what would happen if we kept that lane closure and actually added a new lane closure in the westbound direction as well. So one lane in each direction. And what we found is that would be enough capacity in the roadway to handle all the traffic uh, that's out there. Um, and so um, there would be a little bit more delay. I mean, one lane is less than two, but it'd be a, maybe a few seconds more delay. So it'd be a pretty similar experience to what you have today, but maybe an extra three or four, five seconds to get through the corridor. Um, in terms of what's out there today, uh, the uh, top of the screen is a, a cross section of the corridor. So basically like we slice it kind of right, right through, right across the corridor. And of course, light rail runs right down the middle of it in each direction. Um, we're not going to touch light rail at all. It's there to stay. Um, and, uh, on either side of light rail, it's two lanes in each direction. Um, and then really what happens kind of outside of that varies a lot through the corridor. There are some stretches where there's a narrow sidewalk. Um, there's some stretches where there's no sidewalk at all on either side, um, and you have trees, um, and there's some stretches where that sound wall gets pretty close to the road and there's not a whole lot of room. Um, there is that sound wall that is continuous on both sides. We're not going to be touching that as part of this project. We're not going to be taking right away. Um, that is, is uh, going to stay. Um, so we do have a, a pretty narrow envelope to work within. You know, we're not touching light rail. We're not touching the sound wall. So that kind of gives our, our boundary of, of the areas that we can look to see how we can better reallocate as part of this project. Um, so this uh, next slide, uh, there we go, um, kind of hits on some of the sort of the boundaries that, that we're seeing So the and, and targets. So one is we want to provide bicycle and pedestrian facilities on both sides of Tasman. There are some access points to those mobile home parks that aren't at signalized intersections. And so if people come out on Tasman, there's no way to get across the street there. Light rail's running there, you can't cross. So that's why we want to make sure we have facilities on both sides of Tasman for walking and biking um, so that you can get from one of those mobile home driveways to an intersection to be able to cross the street. Um, we're going to maintain all the access to the mobile home parks. We don't want to eliminate any of that access. Um, we want to stay within the public right away and not acquire any right away or, or impact the sound wall. Um, we want to uh, we will, won't be modifying the light rail. The cost of doing that would be uh, far too expensive. And then our goal is to try and limit some of the tree impacts. Um, we know there's mixed thoughts about how nice some of those trees are and how much of a mess they leave. Um, but the goal is to to try and minimize uh, the number of trees that we're impacting by this project. So we've uh, developed two alternatives um, as part of this project, and alternative one and alternative two, and we'll spend a few slides talking through each one of them. Um, because our goal is to provide bicycle and pedestrian facilities on both sides of the street, we really have no option other than to take a lane if we want to move this project forward. There's always the option to do nothing, but if we want to do something with pedestrian and bicycle on both sides, then we will have to take a lane. So both alternatives uh, go down to one lane in each direction. There's additional room at intersections for turn lanes, but for like the mid middle block segment, it would be one lane in each direction. Um, and uh, and kind of what we do with the pedestrian and the bicycle space is really the difference between the two alternatives. So alternative one uh, shown here on the screen has a what we're calling a multi-use path or a shared use path on each side. Um, so in this, the cars have their own lane, one lane for cars, um, and then but up on the curb, so cars are on the road, up on the curb, there would be this wider space that bicyclists and pedestrians would both share. Um, so there's a picture of an example um, on the uh, on the Bay Trail by 80 um, and uh, in Emeryville there is, is one example. The dimensions aren't quite the same, the feel is not quite the same, but you get this sort of idea, what kind of a wider asphalt area that uh, pedestrians and bicyclists would share. I'm um, going to be about 12 to 16 feet wide, and you could go both directions. So that's really the big benefit here is, um, you know, if you come out of the mobile home parks or one of the driveways and you want to go west, you can go west. If you want to go east, you can go east. You can go either direction, whether you're walking or, or biking. Um, both alternatives actually have the same tree impacts. They both impact up to four trees. 
some additional design, maybe we can get that number down a little bit. But so far, we're, we're looking like about four trees would need to get removed. Um, there may be opportunity to plant some new trees to replace that, um, those trees that are lost. But uh, about four of the existing trees would need to be removed. Um, now we're going to show, th these are some of our uh, snippets from our design. If uh, if you're in the room, we have some boards in the back where you can spend some more time um, looking at these. Um, if you're online, um, then you can spend some more time. I, I think we're going to be uploading the PowerPoint here and, and the meeting uh, recording, so you can spend some more time uh, looking at these if, if you're online after the presentation. Um, this shows the Fair Oaks Avenue intersection uh, with Alternative 1. One of the challenges that we have I guess the more typical configuration here is, is what you see on the south side of the street on the bottom of the page. Um, and this is Fair Oaks is kind of running up down on the left. Tasman's running east west um, across the page. So on the bottom, you can see that that purplish blue area is the shared use path that ties into the corner of the intersection. Um, so if you're riding a bike or walking, you'd approach the corner of the intersection on your bike and then you would um, either uh, get onto the street to use the bike lanes on Fair Oaks or you'd use the crosswalk to get the light rail station. Um, you'd have, you know, options on what to do. Uh, what we have on the north side of the street in front of the retail area is there's some uh, some trees there that are right along, um, basically between the sidewalk and the roadway today. Um, and the only way um, to save those all those trees is to actually split the shared use path there. So the pedestrians would use the existing sidewalk and the cyclists would use a, a two-way cycle track or a two-way bike facility that would be on the other side of the trees. So the trees would be between the pedestrians and the bikes. Um, and then that would continue for a couple hundred feet along the front edge of the retail strip. And then once we get to the corner, then they would merge back in and the bikes would go up onto the corner um, and then would use the crosswalks to, to cross the street. So a little bit of unique consideration here, and that's really to save the trees uh, that are there um, in that current segment. We also have some uh, specific improvements at the intersection to improve safety. Um, so one of them is to modify the crosswalks, because right now you have to cross the light rail tracks twice if you're going from that northeast corner, from the retail corner to the light rail platform. So with a new um, crossing location there that's, uh, that's shown, um, you can actually have just a single crossing to get to the light rail track. So that makes it a little easier there. Um, we can also shorten some of the crossing distances, um, which will, will make it safer for pedestrians as well. And we have some additional bike uh, features to make it easier to turn between Tasman and Fair Oaks as well. Um, next, looking at the Vienna intersection, um, this is a uh, fairly kind of typical configuration for the shared use path. Um, essentially, the shared use paths are up on the curb. They would approach the intersection. Um, both bicyclists and pedestrians would use the crosswalks to either um, access the mobile home park or to continue on on the street. So they would use the crosswalks um, uh, with the with the push buttons and you know kind of like you do uh, today, um, and you can see here in terms of autos, there would be a left turn lane still that exists today that would remain, and there would be the uh, the single through lane uh, for for uh, cars continuing on Tasman. Uh, there's a bus stop there today um, that would remain as well. Um, we are able to extend out the curbs as the little call out uh, here on the screen says. Um, that allows um, for shorter crossing distances and to help slow uh, vehicles down that are turning and improve safety. And then looking um, to the eastern end of the corridor at Lawrence Expressway, um, the existing uh, two left turn lanes from Tasman to Lawrence would stay. And again, we'd be just going down to the one uh, eastbound through lane. Um, again, an opportunity to extend out the curbs to shorten crossing distances, slow vehicle turning speeds uh, to really improve the safety of the pedestrian and bicycle crossing there. All right, the second alternative, um, and this one is a uh, buffered bike lane. Um, so this one uh, may be a little bit uh, more familiar uh, to, to folks. Um, and this one, the bike lane stays in the roadway. Um, so there'd be the vehicle lane, then there'd be a little striped area, as you can see in the picture on the left, um, and then there would be the bike lane. Um, and then up on the curb would be the sidewalk uh, where the pedestrians would be, and that would be for pedestrians only. Um, so it does uh, separate uh, bicycles and autos by that uh, striped buffer area. Um, and then the pedestrians are up on the curb, so the pedestrians and cyclists are separated as well. Um, there is a potential for actually having vertical separation or a barrier um, between the bicyclists and the cars in the future. Um, but the challenge is how to street sweep um, and, and keep the street and bike lane clean 
Um, and so uh, some additional equipment's needed for that. So right now it'd be just a buffered separation between bicyclists and cars, but in the future, uh, there's the potential for it to be a raised separation. Um, tree impacts are, are very similar, slightly different trees, uh, but similar tree impacts is alternative one. Um, so one notable um, difference with this alternative is if you're a cyclist, you have to go the direction of traffic. So you have to go one way, same direction uh, as cars. Um, so it, uh, you know, if you were to approach the core in Vienna and you're trying to go to the east towards Lawrence, you would cross Tasman and then go um, eastbound and the eastbound next to the eastbound traffic lanes. Um, and so if you're coming out of one of the unsignalized driveways from the mobile home park, you would have to, again, follow the direction of traffic. And so if you're trying to go the other way, then you kind of go to the next signalized intersection, cross the street, and come back the other way. So here's what the Fair Oaks intersection looks like. Um, there would be bike lanes in the roadway. Um, we would have this bike slot um, that would be between the through lane and the right turn lane going in the westbound direction. So cyclists would have their own lane that goes all the way up uh, to the intersection there. Um, and then we would have these two stage turn boxes, which we also had an alternative one. You can see on the left side of the screen there. Um, and that would be a place for cyclists to wait um, if they're turning left. So you don't have to actually merge across all the traffic on Tasman. If you're turning left and, and on a bicycle, you can continue through the intersection, wait in the turn box, and then continue on with the, that direction of traffic. Similar improvements in terms of the pedestrian crossing improvements is alternative one. So basically the same pedestrian benefits with this alternative. Um, looking at Vienna, um, so here the bike lanes uh, would continue through the intersection. So cyclists would be in the bike lanes, pedestrians would be on the, on the sidewalk. Um, here we have those similar two-stage turn boxes. So, um, so again, so cyclists wouldn't have to cross the, uh, the traffic, the auto traffic to turn left. They can continue on straight, wait in the turn box until the Vienna signal is uh, the Vienna green light comes on and then cross the street there. Um, an opportunity to extend out the curbs here, but it's a little bit more limited because um, we have the bike lanes still in the roadway. So in terms of crossing distances for pedestrians, they're longer in alternative two because the bikes are in the roadway instead of the curb. So it's a, it's a longer crossing distance with this alternative. And then finally, um, at Lawrence Expressway, uh, pretty similar, again, similar configuration here. The bike lanes would continue to Lawrence Expressway, and here they would end. So the bike lanes would not continue east of Lawrence Expressway on Tasman, as that's outside of, of the study area. Um, there would be some, some upgrades to reduce uh, the, the crosswalk length and turning radius, um, but they would, again, be a little bit longer than, than an alternative one. Okay, so in terms of comparison of the alternatives, um, this multi-use path uh, creates a, all ages and abilities bicycle facility. Um, it's set, different elevation than the roadway level, totally separate from cars. Um, so it really creates a, a nice comfortable bicycle facility that can be used by um, kids and, and everybody of uh, different uh, skill levels and comfort levels with riding a bike. It has this wider surface, um, wider width, um, but it is shared between pedestrians and cyclists. Um, the Fair Oaks Avenue bicycle crossing is a little less intuitive because we have this shared use path going to the two-way bike lane and then back to the shared use path. So it's a little bit um, less consistent with alternative one. Um, and we do ex we haven't done cost estimates yet, but we do expect alternative one to, to cost a lot more because we're moving the curbs a lot more. So it's a lot more construction work in alternative one. With alternative two, um, we're separating the bicycles and the pedestrians, eliminating that potential conflict. Um, people may be more familiar with it because it's more typical placement of the bike lanes in the roadway, um, but there's no physical separation between the, the bikes and the cars, um, at least at the initial project implementation. Um, and there is that potential for out of direction travel uh, for people who are getting onto the corridor not at a signalized intersection. Um, but, you know, we're, we're excited uh, about both alternatives and, and looking for community input um, because they both achieve the project goals of um, providing continuous walking facilities on both sides of the roadway, uh, providing uh, a wide and comfortable facility for cyclists with new landscaping in several locations, um, improve the crossings and the safety of the crossings. Um, it creates a bicycle facility and with both alternatives and creates a, a key link in the city and a regional uh, bicycle network. So both alternatives achieve a lot of the goals uh, that the project set out for. Um, so with that, we're, we're really here um, because uh, we, we've developed two alternatives, but before we move forward, we want to hear from the community about your preferences, your comments, your concerns about uh, one or both of them. 
um, as well as your preferences. And so we have an online survey that we encourage everybody to take if you haven't already. It's It's been up for a few days and we already have a, a lot of responses. So that's great to see. Um, and, and hopefully we'll get some more after tonight and some of the upcoming meetings. So the survey is open for a couple more weeks. You have until March 15th. Um, you can get to it from the project website or you can do QR code from the, from the uh, uh, slide here on the screen. Um, and there's a direct link to it as well. So if you haven't already, please uh, go and, and take the survey. Um, we would love your input, and that's really going to inform where this project goes next. Speaking of which, uh, next steps. So we're going to be um, receiving community input. Um, the survey, as I mentioned, is open till March 15th. Um, we have a couple meetings lined up for early March um, at the mobile home uh, parks and the recreation centers there. Um, so I think we're confirming the date of the third one, but in, in early March, we'll have meetings at each of the mobile home parks. Um, from that information, we'll be refining the alternatives and preparing cost estimates. Um, and then we'll come back to the community. Um, we expect in the June and July timeframe with that information and we'll share what we heard uh, from you all uh, back to everybody. So, so you understand what, you're, what the community is telling us um, and how that might inform our decision uh, moving forward. Um, so with that, I'll, I'll hand it back to Brandy and, and thanks for your participation this evening. Yes, thank you for all that great information. Um, just to remind folks on the online, there are ways to ask questions. And I think we do have two questions already. I know you guys might have some questions. I'm going to hand you the microphone so everyone can hear you online. If you do have a question or comment you'd like to make. But since we do have questions already lined up, let's go to the, the virtual folks. Are you ready? Yeah. The first question, have we um, done any counts and taken numbers on bikes and peds that are already using the temporary lane? Yeah, we do have the counts. I, I actually don't have that information in front of me uh, here tonight, but we did some counts in um, in the fall of last year. Um, you know, the the there definitely was some activity. The number of bicyclists wasn't super high, um, but a large part because it doesn't go anywhere. You know, the 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 closed off lane is only between Vienna and Fair Oaks, so. Um, it doesn't, you can't get all the way to Lawrence and there's nothing on the north side of the street. So, so the bikes, there's only a handful of bikes out there. Um, definitely some pedestrians, but, um, you know, I, I don't have the count offhand. Yeah. And that is okay. I think it's just in general yeah. that we want to get a feel for how the facility is already being used. If it's not being used, why are we looking at this option? But there's a lot of good reasons why we are. So, um, second question, um, did we take into account the large building projects going on in the area, the Moffat Park project and the Keeley project? This will increase traffic in roughly five years. Yeah, it's a, that's a good question. Um, the analysis we've done so far is, is based on the current volumes, so the traffic that's out there now. Um, but that's a, that's a good point to raise um, about the uh, upcoming activity. Um, but uh, you know, our analysis has shown that right now there's a lot of extra capacity in the roadway for cars. Um, so, um, you know, even if, if volumes continue to increase, we expect there to still be capacity, but th this is something we can talk to the city staff about further. Great. Is there anybody in the audience that wants to speak or ask a question? There you go, sir. Hi, my name is Jason. I live at Casa de Amigos. Um, I'm just curious, any ballpark idea of what option one and option two might conceivably cost? <laughs> It's a good question. Um, you know, I, I don't have any numbers to share tonight. Next time, we'll definitely have some numbers ready. Um, with alternative one, we will be moving the curb line. So uh, we're basically picking up the curb and, and shifting it towards the roadway. Um, and so there's drainage inlets all along the roadway. And so those will all have to get moved. Um, and then it's all the curb reconstruction work. So that's the main difference in cost is that. Um, so I don't have a number, but it's it's going to be, I would say, fairly substantially more for alternative one, um, where we move the curb, than an alternative two where we don't. Uh, but next time we'll have some cost numbers ready. Um, I'm wondering, I have actually two things. One is, I have a question, and then will there be a chance to sort of make a statement or share any thoughts about living in the area and that kind of thing like we do at City Council? Was that be after, question after? Okay. Okay, well, first, let me ask the question, and then I can say the other pieces. Um, what about the speed limit? And and I will say, we walk there all the time. Sometimes we see cars that appear to go going as fast as 70 miles an hour. And I'm just going to say, I have raised two kids there. My son had a dream when he was little. He's now 23. And his dream, he wanted a basket to go on his bike so he could bike to the store. He could never do that 
None of the kids in CASA can get a little basket for their bike to safely go to the store. On top of that, they're landlocked because you can't even really safely get to the bus stop on Fair Oaks. And so I think this is so wonderful that we're doing this and we're giving them the chance because now we even have Seven Seas Park, which wasn't there when they were little. And this also gives them the chance to have the freedom, the freedom to safely also bike over to Columbia Middle School or safely go over to the park at um, Lakewood and Lakewood's gonna have this wonderful new library. I mean, this is giving our kids freedom and the freedom to then grow up and be responsible and get around and make friends in the community. So I'm really, really pleased that we're looking at this. We moved here in 1996 and honestly, we never meant to stay at CASA. We meant to move somewhere else. And in 1996, there were bike and pedestrian lanes on either side. And I could safely go and visit my friends in another mobile home park without going across two lanes of traffic, which before pandemic was going like 50 miles an hour and the light rail, which I'll tell you, okay, don't, shh. When we go across and we get too close to the light rail, they honk. They really do not like us crossing. And I will not admit that we cross because I think we're not supposed to. But let's face it, we all do. We need to leave. We need to get out of our park. We need to have the opportunity to go on our own two feet on our bicycles to do this. So I appreciate all the work you're doing. And I'm very much in favor of option one because it has the, the bi-directional um, opportunities to do that. So thank you all. Um, yeah, with respect to the speed limit, so that's not part of the study right now, but I think it's sort of a byproduct of the study. So if, um, with both of these alternatives, we expect the speed on the roadway to, to drop. I think there is maybe more of an opportunity for that with alternative one because we're narrowing the width of the roadway. And studies have shown that basically the narrower driving width, uh, uh, drivers slow down. And so I think alternative one has more of a potential to lower vehicle speeds. And so once this project gets implemented, then the city will have an opportunity to implement, um, do some speed studies and see if there's a way to lower the speed limit. So I think that's something that, that could come out of this. I just have a comment. Diane Johansson, I live at CASA. I've been there since 2008, and I'm really happy to see this because I'm a cyclist and I have not been riding my bike enough and I would love to be able to walk to the store. And I know there's a lot of my neighbors who feel the same way. So I'm thrilled. So I have a, a question about design. The Casa entrance, the secondary, the small one that people sometimes aren't supposed to, but walk across because, you know, it's there. Um, is there any type of a design model that's, you know, not a completely new invented thing where if they if Sunnyvale wanted to make a pedestrian crosswalk across there, that there could be some type of, you know, like when you see a, a train track, a lot of times you'll have these gates that when the train passes by, they go down so a car can't cross, or they have that in Sunnyvale on Sunnyvale, um uh Sunnyfeld Avenue, um, where even pedestrians have a, a like a five foot one, right? Where it just goes down when a train is coming. And when it leaves, it goes up so that that could possibly be converted so that people could actually walk across there or bike across there. Yeah. While you're thinking on that, let me ask. I just want to remind everyone on the uh, Zoom that we don't have a hand raised feature. So please type your question in to the, the comment box and then we will read it out loud and get it answered. So. Adam, do you want? Oh, so yeah. that's Lillian saying with the city of Sunnyvale. Um, so to um, to your point in terms of um, adding crossings, um, we, so we call it we call it that type of crossing um, at Great Crossing at Railroad. Um, so the city is actually actively trying to eliminate um, this type of crossing within the city. So currently, um, especially currently, we are we have um, two of them um, crossing at the Caltrain Railroad track. And so we have projects that um, we're trying to separate those so that it, it is safer for all users. Um, and in terms of railroad, we currently don't have any project currently to try to eliminate that. But then at the same time, we aren't planning on adding, adding additional crossing um, um, to, to, the, to the light rail system um, mid-block. The question is, what are the pros and cons of removing them? Um, so with 
uh, with a great crossing, um, there's a safety aspect to it just because um, there are, if they are separated, meaning that it's either an overcrossing or undercrossing, um, there, you know, there's going to be safety in, it, safety will be improved for people, for bicyclists or pedestrians who try to cross as well as for drivers. Yeah, and I'll just say in, in that particular location, so at intersections, there's more room, the road widens out, but in that particular location, there isn't extra room. So there's not really a place to put the crossing gates and have people wait safely out of the way and so that sort of thing. So so there, there's just not really, it's a very creative idea, but there, there's just not really uh, a, a way to make a safe crossing there. Yeah. I think we have some other questions or kind of comments related to traffic, the additional traffic that uh, we see during Levi Stadium events and um, how emergency access vehicles uh, may may traverse this area. Our streets are now backing up with the one lane near uh, Plaza del Rey. How will safety vehicles get into our parks in an emergency with only one lane? Yeah, so the the first question about the Levi Stadium events, that is something that we definitely took a look at. Um, the uh, Levi Stadium um, circulation plan, event circulation plan actually has all the traffic um, using from this area kind of using Lawrence. So Lawrence is like the start of the pathway in. Um, so we've done some observations, looked at overall activity and game days and really west of Lawrence, there just isn't that much of a difference um, during game days. So, um, you know, while that was something we, we wanted to make sure we looked at, we didn't really find any issues um, that would cause any particular problems on game days for, for moving this project forward. Um, you know, the comment about um, the effect of a single lane, I mean, I think that that is something we want to make sure everybody understands and, and we're, we're forthcoming about is that, you know, with a single lane of traffic, if you're behind a, a truck that's using the roadway or something like that that's going slower, you, you won't be able to pass them. Um, you know, the comment, somebody was asking about the bus. Yes, when the bus is at the bus stop, you won't be able to pass the bus. So that is certainly a trade-off for this. There's not really any, any way around that and still accommodating the bicycle and pedestrian facilities. So yeah, there will be certain times where you get stuck behind the vehicle that's not going as fast as you'd like. Um, and that uh, will cause some, some extra delay. Um, you know, in terms of emergency vehicle access, we're working um, really closely with uh, the fire department and, and other emergency services uh, to make sure that they're comfortable with the concepts and we've shown them the concepts and, and they're on board and, and there's some uh, design treatments that we can do to, to make sure that they're able to, uh, to perform their job, um, even with the roadway options. So that's something we're, we're taking very seriously and, and are incorporating into these concepts. Great, thank you. We don't have any other questions online at the moment, but do we have any other questions or comments from our attendees in person? You know, just uh, want to reiterate that we do have the survey that's um, out. We have been getting some really good feedback on that already. It's open till the March 15th, and we're coming to the mobile home parks next week, uh, March 6th and March 7th. So lots of lots of community engagement on this one. We have more questions. Well, it's not a question, but just feedback. I don't, I don't know if it's in the survey question or not, but um, as far as the options, like we're here in person, might as well just say, I like option one a lot more because, you know, you've got this pooling effect of the, you know, the the roadway width. And, and a lot of times there's multiple people walking. Um, sometimes there's multiple people biking and to have to segment it, you know, not great. And as the biker, which I'm definitely am, uh, cars do, you know, some go the speed limit, but some do go much faster. And, um, you know, that that would feel very unsafe having a buffered lane the way cars sometimes drive through that area. And a lot of them are not from their neighborhood. They just kind of pass by. So as a safety issue, um, it would feel much safer to have a full combined like option one provides. Um, so I have um, so I want to mention something. So when we come out of Casa de Amigos and we make the right to go there currently, there are frequently people walking in that lane at the moment, sometimes walking the opposite direction and doing all of that. It really scares me. I mean, there have been times you have to pay really close attention and I get very concerned because I personally have called in multiple accidents with people speeding down, going westbound on Tasman to the point where before pandemic, I'd hear the boom and I knew to grab my phone. 
Like that's a really scary thing. When the first time it was scary, the second time when you're like, I feel like I'm trained as a call in. Thank God since pandemic, I've not heard the boom. But this is really great because I think it's going to save lives. I really do. And, and that's what's, I think, important in the work we all do to make Sunnyvale safer, more bicycle accessible and accessible for everybody. So I want to mention that. And then I also want to mention for those of you who like dogs in the park, you're really not supposed to walk your dog in the park. And people will take their dogs along the lanes currently, and they'll take the dog across all the lanes to walk over there. So option one, I think, or whatever you're looking at, please think of your furry friends and how that can make it easier for also kids to be able to walk their dogs along that spot. And, rem and also signs, hopefully, to remind people to clean up after this. <laughs> and to your point about the survey, we are asking, we're, we're asking questions about how people are currently using it. How would they use it if there was better options? And then we're asking folks to really choose a preferred alternative or no alternative at all. We have, we have plenty of options. And we do have another question online. Can't the lanes be narrowed for optional two also? Or option two also, sorry. Not quite sure I'm uh, understanding some, that one. Yeah, uh, yeah, clarification. I mean, I so the, I mean, the idea would be with both options to to make the lanes generally narrower and, and accommodate, you know, still require, you know, accommodate the required width for vehicles, but make them generally as narrow as possible to maximize pedestrian and bicycle space. Um, so with both options, we're, we're narrowing the lanes as, as feasible. I, I think guess. is I, it might be narrowing the lanes versus taking a lane. Oh yeah, so that's, probably that, that's a good question. Yeah, so um, there is not enough, um, not enough space where we can just narrow the lanes and keep the two and still provide bicycle and pedestrian facilities. Um, there's barely enough room for us to take the one lane and provide the facilities that we need. So um, it's a very good question of like, can you just keep the two traffic lanes? Um, but you really don't get enough space if you do that to be able to do anything else. Oh, sure. So Michael, Michael Fagan, who's also a CASA resident, he's in favor of option one. And he just, he's, he ag agrees. It's just a matter of time until a pedestrian gets hit on our side of the street on Tasman. So we don't want that to happen. So he's really thankful we're doing this. Michael. Thank you, Michael. Also needs curbs. Curbs, yeah. Anything else on, oh, we have- yeah, I think there's a couple more online. A couple more coming on. I think there's some um, also some chatter, some comments about um, you know advocacy for keeping keeping lanes, no don't taking no taking away lanes. There's um, sometimes five to ten minutes at the light to get into the community. Um, I'd like to I'd like to understand that a little more too. I'm wondering if whoever made the comment online could could be a little more specific, and maybe we can dive into that a little more. Um, and then we've got a question. Can the city post on next door when the mobile home meetings will take place? Our mobile home parks are large and not always good communication. <laughs> I didn't mean to call that one out. Um, I will announce for you, yes, we can um, work with the city to get more information. We've been also advertising in the mobile home communities. Uh, there's some flyers that we put together that should have been uh, received in the your e-newsletters as well, but we are um, hosting... Is it Plaza del Rey on Wednesday, March 6th from 5 to 7.30 and then El Dorado uh, Thursday, March 7th from th the same time, 5 to 7.30. And these are going to be kind of an open house style more. We're asking folks to come in when they can, meet with staff, take a look at the boards, take the survey. So um, please join us for those. And I think we're trying to get to yeah, think, Casa, de, Casa Amigos. I think Casa we're Amigos, planning yeah. on a day still, right? Yeah. Okay, yeah, so we'll be coming to your community, <laughs> the folks that are here tonight. Okay. Um, oh, I'm sorry, 5.30 to 7.30, yes. That's our setup time. Okay, 5.30 to 7. Thank you, Monica, for straightening me out. Do we have any other questions, comments coming in online? We have a few more minutes. Just... Question online. Can you do what um, 
we did Lake Mill Road and make a vehicle and bike bicycle lane. Yeah, and so I believe that's referring to the Sharrows that are on Lick Mill. So basically, uh, with the Sharrow, you have the vehicle lane, and then in the vehicle lane, you stripe in kind of like a little bike symbol. Um, you know, that uh, is certainly an option, um, but it uh, really doesn't provide a comfortable facility for cyclists. Um, you know, studies have shown that Sharrows aren't particularly effective. Um, at, uh, you know, they would only be implemented in really lower speed locations, kind of community residential streets. Um, so I don't think a, a Shero would be a, a great solution here. Um, if we want to uh, create a safe and comfortable facility for cyclists, um, I think it's, it's um, you know, in terms of it's, it's always an option, but in terms of achieving the goals of the project of creating that bicycle uh, friendly facility, I, I'm not sure it, it really provides that. So. Anything else from you? Yeah. Yes. Oh, I'm sorry. Of the study itself? What? Assuming this is approved, could you repeat the timing of all the, of when it's going to go to city council and then when the next thing would be happening, how it's being funded, and then all the rest of the details? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Sounds good. So, um, you know, this current study, we're, we're hoping to come back to the community in June or July um, with our second round of outreach. Um, and uh, then we would get that additional community input. And then we'd go to the Bicycle and Pedestrian Advisory Commission again. Um, we were there a few weeks ago. So we'd go back to that, that group um, and then to city council. I think the goal would be to hit maybe in October city council or so. Dates could change a little bit, but that's our current target. Um, and so then at that city council, we, um, we might go twice to city council. Um, and at that uh, kind of final city council meeting, the goal would be to get some sort of clear direction from the city council if there's a, a single alternative that should advance and, and whether it should advance. Um, and, you know, no decisions have been made. Certainly on this project, we're just uh, throwing out alternatives and getting community input. But um, at that point, the city council may choose to take an action to move something forward. So we're doing... Um, what's called around like concept design or 10% design. So it's um, pretty early on. So if, if something moves forward, um, money needs to be found first. There's no money set aside yet. So um, some money needs to be found. Um, and then, uh, then actual final design would need to occur. Um, and so that'll take, um, you know, at least a year, could take longer if, you know, to find the money and things like that. So, um, and then construction, does vary probably between alternative one and two alternative one would take a little longer to build um so i think we're still looking years out before something gets implemented um and really i think the the funding is probably the key determinant of whether it's like two or three years or longer so the creation of vta uh, putting the light rail there really caused this problem. Like I say, when we were here in 96, before VTA, we had a bike pedestrian lane on either side. Does there, is there any way to get funding to bring back what we had before because it was taken away by VTA? Is that an added, is there some area funding from VTA or funding from some, like, I believe I was told that it actually wasn't appropriate for them to have taken away our bike and pedestrian lanes when they put the VTA in. And as residents there, we deserve to have a bike and pedestrian lane so we can get out of our area. And that was taken away from us when the VTA was put in. So I'm wondering if any of you could address that angle and therefore finding funding from something that was taken away from residents who had it. Um. I, do you understand the question? Yeah, I, yeah. I, you know, I wasn't certainly involved uh, back then in this, um, so I don't know the history. But um, you know, VTA does not have money set aside for this project or to fund those improvements. There are a variety of grant programs, uh, some of which VTA manages, um, that could implement a project like this. So there are some potential funding sources, um, but there's not a there's not a pot of money that we can just tap into right away on this. To me, 
this feels like this was unfairly taken away from the residents and therefore they're ideally in some perfect world should have a way to have it rectified, I guess is what I'm saying, without us having to try to find this money some magical place. That's all. My <laughs> that was a trade-off then probably, <laughs> right? When yeah. they were looking to bring in a light rail system to move people through the corridor, there are trade-offs just like this project, right? So, yeah. Okay. Any other questions, Monica? Did you forward me anything else or? Okay. Another comment. Um, Lick Mill is a slow street with schools and bikes and vehicles share the street today. So it's just in line with the last comment that was made on that. We have one more. Yep. One more question. You want to take it? Um, how can emergency vehicles get through heavy traffic for option one? Yeah, I mean, the, with option one, there is one lane in each direction. So um, the, the vehicles would have to um, either mount the curb or you know, wait for traffic to clear um, with option one. With option two, um, there is a little bit more room because there's the bike lane that the emergency vehicles could use. Um, so that is a bit of a difference between the two alternatives. Um, but yeah, with with option one, um, the the emergency vehicle would either mount the curb or would um, you know, or wait for traffic to clear. Okay, I think we're going to pretty much done with the online comments. I think we're going to close it out. And again, just promoting, you know, the the survey, your opportunities, multiple opportunities to you know, give your input, go on to the uh, city's website. And what are we Googling on this city website? Transportation projects, Sunnyvale Tasman Drive. So we can... Go ahead. Um, I would say that if you Google City of Sunnyvale Tasman Drive and then you click on that link, it will take you to our 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 uh, transportation page, and then you saw the tab with Tasman uh, pedestrian and uh, bicycle improvement. You click on that tab, and it will have all the detail in there with the survey, and then with all that um um meeting, past meeting, and an upcoming meeting. So we have all the detail on there. Thank you, project manager. All right, so I think we're going to close it out. I want to thank you for coming out, for, for you all coming here in person, and for all of you online joining us. Thanks. Have a good evening.